Hey, so I'm Trexler, if we haven't met yet, but um, I just wanted to um, dig into the lesson this week. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13, um, studying, so I just want to kind of walk through a little bit and give you a little, a few little tidbits I pulled away here from the passage. Um, in my Bible, it's titled uh, Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, but as I was reading through a few of commentaries and things, um, another common name is called the Troubling Gospel, and I, I really like that title for this little passage. As we get into it, you'll kind of see why. But we know this idea, and um, it's it's very obvious today that the, the gospel is a divisive message. Um, and this is what we're going to look at here today. And we see you know, Jesus in, stated in Matthew 10, you know, he's coming to, to separate that the gospel was not going to, um, you know, just be wonderful and like, you know, widely accepted that it was going to be divisive. It was going to cause separations. It talks about splitting families because of the gospel from believers and non-believers. Um, so we're, we're going to look at just how divisive this can be sometimes. Um, throughout Acts, this the persecution is slowly building. Um, the division is not due to hatred, but it's due to the, the message opposing what the world is thinking, what the, what the Jews, what the Gentiles were wanting, how they were believing. Um, and so we see this opposition and this persecution continue to grow and grow and grow. And eventually it gets violent and leads to some things. Um, but this week it just um, kind of starts to boil over a little bit. So if we dig in, it says, um, uh, this is Paul and Barnabas. And they had been preaching. And it says in verse 42, as they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about matters following the, on the following Sabbath. Um, after it had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. So in, in verse 42, it says, As they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. And what we see initially is a, a good reaction to the gospel. We don't see this divisiveness quite yet. And it's almost encouraging. I was thinking about like how encouraging it must have been to them too that like they're walking out of out of church, out of preaching, and the people who are walking continuing to say, Hey, we want to hear more, you know. Not many times after a sermon does a pastor hey hear, Hey, we want you to preach more, we want to keep going. Um, but they're they're being encouraged that people are asking questions, they're really digging in. Um, and we just see this really positive like attraction to the gospel. Um they're saying, hey, we want, you to, we want you to preach more. We want to hear you again. And so the next week, the following Sabbath, almost the whole town, so it was a large crowd, now goes to an even larger crowd, um, assembled to hear the word of the Lord. And this is where um, things get tricky. It says, but when the Jews saw the crowd. And right there in verse 45, um, you key in on the word but. That's this transition, right? It's going good, and now things are starting to change a little bit. The Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy, and began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. Um, they saw, the, the Jews saw how much of a, a crowd they saw. It was just this big, popular event, and they didn't like that, because what was being preached was opposition to them. Um, they wanted religious control. They wanted the power. But the, their preaching was, was pointing towards Jesus and away from them, um, towards the, the real Messiah, not um, what they were believing. So they're not liking this power, and it's about to get even more divisive here in a second. And they replied, or Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. So they look at the, they look at God's chosen people, and they're like, hey, you needed to hear the message first more than the Gentiles. You know, it was the pastor looking to the church saying, hey, I need to preach to the Christians before I preach to the lost because the Christians are having the problems. And as you can guess, I didn't really like that. And so that's where we see this first big division coming in. And so this is what I hold on to is it's like this idea that like sometimes, you know, you when you're a Christian, you may be strong in faith, but sometimes the message is still for you. It's not just for the lost. It's not just for um, the the people outside of the church and this makes a good talking point like think about when was the message when when that message you felt you needed to hear even though maybe um, it may have been aimed at the lost or it may have not been pointed to you but it still it still um, spoke to you 
But then we keep going, and he says, hey, we're speaking to the Gentiles, and this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So he tells God's people, hey, you need help. We need, you need to listen to this first. And he tells the Gentiles, their enemies, hey, we're here to be a light for you. So there's this big, you know, racial, social divide that they've just made. Hey, and now the Jews are mad. Um, it's being said, hey, not only do God's chosen people need to hear the word of God, but now you have to share the word of God. Um, and I think this is another point that I kind of think of is like in church, how often, you know, do we think like, you know, this is my church, you know, like what, what are they doing? Why, you know, we're, we're, we need to, are we sure we need to go talk to them? Um, we get this idea like, you know, it's, this is my Jesus. Well, no, he, he loves each and every one of us, but he's for the world. Um, you know, it's not church isn't made to just the people that look like us or in the social class like us. And this is a good, a good talking point here is like, have you ever kind of experienced that, seen that, maybe been on the wrong side of that? Um, and just kind of talk to that idea. Like, do we get that idea still sometimes that like, you know, that not necessarily elitism, maybe that like the church is for us and it can even go as far into like, you know, we're Baptists, not, you know, um, Methodists or Church of Christ or whatever. Like, this is for us. Like, this is our Bible, our faith, not theirs. Theirs is way off. When, you know, there's there's all these divisions that we bring amongst ourselves. But the, we, we see, and they continue to go, when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord. How How do we react to hearing the word of the Lord? You see God's chosen people hear the word of the Lord, and they start to get upset. They start to take it personally. They're like, oh, the, he's stepping on my toes. The Gentiles hear, and they say, hey, man, we, we, we're we rejoicing. We're thankful for this. Um, and I think sometimes we, we tend to maybe take both sides of that sometimes. Like, you know, pastor's stepping on my toes this week. Um, he's really coming after me. Um, instead of, you know, encouraging him, say, hey, pastor, like, like they did in the beginning, that was a good message. Like, I can't wait for next week. Um, so is there, is there times where maybe where maybe we, we don't respond how we should to hearing God's word? Um, or you could even kind of frame a question like, you know, how can we appropriately respond to God's word? Or what can we do to better respond to God's word or, and, and watch how we respond to it instead of just getting this kind of selfish attitude? Um, but they were told, you know, you need to hear this message. But then but then the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. So this is where we see more persecution kind of starting to come into play. Um, and expelled them from their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. And here's the very last part. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So another kind of big talking point, um, a thing that I really kind of focus on when I was reading this is they were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. How how do we respond when we have to deal with persecution? You know, is it we, we just, you know, oh, woe is me. You know, it's, it's, you know, somebody opposed my beliefs today and the world is over. Or do we understand, hey, we have joy because, one, we just had an opportunity to present the truth to them. We had an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Or we're just saying, like, oh, like, I can't believe it. Like, it's just personal and, you know, the world is ending. No, we should have joy. And then um, I really like, I was reading a little bit in um, John MacArthur's commentary, and he talks about where it was, where it says they're filled with the Holy Spirit. It uses the word, and you may have heard this word, this Greek word, dunamis, um, which is, uh, the power residing within a thing is a very literal definition. It's where we get the word dynamite and, you know, some kind of explosive major change. But you have to remember that that explosive outcome is not always positive. You know, we think, oh, like I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. So that means like I'm just going to explode with great things. Big things are going to happen when I open my Bible and start speaking. And we see right here like good things happen, but there was kind of the negative explosion. The persecution blew up too. 
So are we prepared to deal with a negative response to the gospel? Are we prepared to saying, hey, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I have that joy and I know that um, when I'm sharing the gospel, when I'm presenting the, the word of God, like not everything is going to be, you know, perfect and wonderful, but that's not on me. My job is just to, to teach and share as God calls me and let him take care of the rest. But are we prepared? Are, do we respond to hearing the word like the Jews and taking it personally that I'm already a Christian? Like, why are you trying to tell me how to be a better Christian or more of a Christian? Or do we take it as, you know, constructive criticism is, hey, I, I'm striving to live like Christ, but I can do that better and better each and every day. You know, I may take baby steps. You may, you know, jog half a mile in that growth, but there's always growth to be found. And are we going to look like the Gentiles and rejoice and be thankful for the word of God? So I really, really like this idea that the gospel is troubling because it's just a good reminder. And not that the gospel is scary, but that not every gospel interaction is going to be positive. Um, that there's going to be rejection. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be pain that comes with it. But that doesn't mean that there's not fruit that's going to come from that, whether it's later or very far down the road. But it doesn't mean that there's not ever going to be positive. But we have to be prepared. So, you know, that talking point of are you prepared um, for a negative response of the gospel? I just want you guys to know that I'm thankful for, for you leading and teaching our church um, we're very appreciative of what you do, and I'm praying for you, and I hope this week is just a fruitful lesson um, and that you're able just to take your class and grow and lead and teach.